this is how the philosophy worked alterations of the mineral. So, you might do it intentionally or nature might be doing it without your knowledge. So, we have sometimes naturally occurring zeolites also and that is the reason I do not know whether you are aware or not in practices particularly when you fast they say they ask you to eat a certain type of salt not the salt which is normally grown or cultivated in the salt pans because that is a inorganic salt. The one which is available in the rock form we call it as rock salt is nothing but zeolitic. So, when you consume that what happens your body gets detoxified in ancient India and particularly most of the temples right now also Babaji's give you some vibhuti to eat. It is a very scientific thing these are nothing but the same material. So, when you perform yagna, yagna I think you understand yagna clear. So, all sorts of good materials are used best possible ghee, best possible grains, wood, charcoal and what do they do? They combust everything and after that whatever remains are ashes are given as a prasad. What are these ashes? If you take a sample and zoom them they are all activated ashes clear something like this. So, what I have been doing is I have been simulating the same thing in the laboratory. All these activated systems will have peculiar characteristics we will talk about this later on. So, if you see some of the scanning electron micrographs of the original ash samples it is a different world of microscopic attributes you know you can count you can uh, quantify you can realize what is the composition of the material first of all. Prima facie what you see here is there are few circular particles and there are few platelets agreed. There are few irregular shaped particles also and then another peculiar feature you are observing is that something is sticking on another particle in the form of a you know precipitate. Look at all these white colored particles. So, if you check the intensity of the surface in terms of the color you can realize whether it is opaque or it is transparent. That also gives you an idea about what type of mineral you are dealing with. So, these are the evidences which I create to understand the material better. This is another type of uh, situation which I wanted to capture. Most of the time when you come across a research paper you will find several of these photographs is it not. So, interpretation is most important. See this is all nature's creation or maybe thermal power plant plants creation. Look at this several particles of the ash sitting inside a big particle like a cauliflower is it not. And then there are few particles which are the parking places for different types of other small particles look at this. Now, this is how we see what is going on inside the sample that is why the material science is being fast uh, you know adopted by uh, civil engineers nowadays. Another thing you must be observing is the intensity of the particles was quite less in the first picture but this is growing slowly and slowly and a stage comes where the whole area or the whole frame is full of particle growth. So, there are two ways of interpreting these results. The process is going as a function of time it is a control process. So, when I write sample S1, F1, S2, F2 and all these things these are the designated codes for the sample which correspond to a type of treatment. And when we talk about treatment that means some chemicals have been used, some pressure temperature conditions have been used and time is guiding the whole process. And the most beautiful thing would be like this. So, those of us who are interested in wearing jewelries and if I want to create artificial jewelries what can I do? I can do something like this look at this and this is what is available in the market right now. So, this could be a natural process or this could be a man made process and so on. So, in short SEM helps you in realizing what is going on in the system and how to manipulate it. Manipulation the right word not in the bad connotation. So, as an engineer most of the time what do I do? I try to manipulate or negotiate with the material.
Now, this is something very interesting for those of you who might get a chance to work in chemical processes or uh, like for designing let us say anti pollution masks, what is required now is in NCR region. Low cost filters, if somebody asks you to design, I mean this is the solution. So, here what I have written is the examination of the ash particle due to flue gas conditioning. Now, flue gas conditioning is normally done in the thermal power plants, so that I can stop the PPMs which are coming out of the stacks or the chimneys. Stack is nothing but a chimney. So, when you are combusting coal and the fly ash has a tendency to go out into the atmosphere through the stacks or other types of gases which are quite toxic in nature. So that I mean at last you are burning coal. So, it might be having lot of sulphur, it might be having lot of different type of compounds of sulphur which are going to be very, very dangerous or nitrates, nitrites and so on. So, I want to capture all these particles, I do not want anything to go into the atmosphere. So, this is where what you do is you inject something into the stacks and that is what is known as flue gas conditioning. I can use water, I can use sulfuric acid, I can use ammonia, I can use sulfur trioxide, I can use water vapors and so on. The whole idea is to allow accelerated agglomeration of the fine particles of the ash all right. So, this is how it happens at different stages of dosing how the agglomeration of the particle grows. It is like doing your, your Stokes law you know hydrometer analysis which you have done in your third year soil mechanics in a huge tall chimney of power plant 30 meter 40 meter tall chimney. And what I am doing here is I am trying to accelerate the process of you know sedimentation of the particles in the flue gas not in the water not in the fluid in the gaseous state. So, in short by doing this flue gas conditioning you can enhance the precipitation of the particles and hence they will not go into the air. And this is the evidence which you can show to people how good your flue gas conditioning is working. Why I am showing you all these things is because these are the applications of a scanning electron microscopy which you might be using for your R and D or any purpose. What is your first reaction? You like this type of things or not? I enjoy doing all this. So, for me these things are very precious because for me I have converted all this thing into a fertilizer. You know this? So, I can sell all this in the market. So, one side power plant is running, second side I am collecting all these things and for me this is a sodium sulphate if I am doing sulphur. What is sodium sulphate? It is a manure or ammonium, sodium ammonium sulphates also I can create, carbonates I can create and so on. Some more applications of SEM. We have been talking about materials of different types, but you never saw them. So, I am sure this is the first time you are seeing the microscopic pictures of the materials which are being used in contemporary science and technology. I would not say geotechnical or civil engineering only because these materials are being used by everybody. So, the first one which I have shown here is the silica fume. On this TV screen you can see that this is quite furry structure, lot of features like fur you know on the surface. What will happen because of this? they become airborne very easily. Why government of India has banned child labor at most of the industries? One reason is this, because if you are dealing with such type of particles which are very fine, very furry and which are lighter than air, what is going to happen? The chances are you will inhale them. So, what is going to happen if I inhale them? What is the problem? The lighter the material, more furry the material, more surface area. And slowly and slowly we will quantify all these things and we will get a good idea about when I say the surface area is very high, how much the surface area could be. So, 
this is 20 microns all right. So, suppose if I put this scale over here this is highly 20 microns and this has been zoomed to certain level say 1000 times or whatever. So, you have to apply that correction factor that is the reason these type of silica fumes are supposed to be highly carcinogenic because once they go inside the lungs what is going to happen surface area is very high. So, whatever water is present in the lungs they have a tendency to suck it what is lung cirrhosis they sometimes you know lung cells of the lungs are dying why because of the pollution. So, if all the water is sucked from the cells these cells die and if cells die in your body what is going to happen that is a critical stage understood. So, this is how the industrialization is linked with the human health. Fortunately, this material is supposed to be a boon for uh, creating a concrete look at the paradox extremely fine particles and if I insert them in the matrix of the concrete the concrete becomes more durable pure silica purest form of silica very light material becomes airborne. If I insert it in the con concrete matrix the concrete finest pores will also get choked and hence the durability will be maximum. But again the problem is like human body if the doses are more than 4 to 5 percent it starts acting like a what it will do it will absorb all the water which is present in the concrete onto itself and hence the chemical reaction which are supposed to happen in the concrete will not happen. Are you realizing the issues? It is not easy that you just take the material and mix it in the concrete and create a concrete it is not so easy. So, this is where you have to optimize the doses of everything. So, more than 5 to 6 percent this becomes corrosive in nature less than 4 5 percent it acts like a you know material which would enhance the durability of the concrete. So, these are the properties of silica fumes. Now, tell me one thing if a material is extremely light specific gravity would be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 what type of problems industries might be facing apart from the one which I have already discussed. So, the transportation of silica yes, fumes is right. very difficult. Very good. So, transportation is going to be extremely difficult how would you bring this material to the project site why because the volumes occupied by silica fume are very large compared to the weight. exactly you are right so the biggest question is how would you bring it to the project site what could be the answer uh, make a slurry form and then that's a research topic because the moment you make a slurry of water remember these materials have activity you can't dry them up later on maybe in inert materials like kerosene. Now, read more and more about this because this is an interesting research area. Cross country if you have to dispatch this material most of the time India you know gets this material from different countries. Transportation is a big problem particularly when it is coming in a sea liner why suppose if it is a ship you use your concepts of physics which you have done in terms of CG meta center and all those things. So, what is going to happen if you have a very lighter material filled up in the ships what is going to happen they are going to be very unstable fine. So, these are the issues which uh, people are trying to sort out there are several issues they appear to be very simple, but they are very intricate because of the uh, waves the instability of the ships might occur. CG versus meta center of and center of pressure three things on the same line imagine. Now, this is BFS uh, we call it as a blast furnace slag blast furnace slag comes out of the uh, blast furnaces where the steel is being uh, manufactured. So, what you are observing is that these are basically highly irregular shaped materials and hence they are inert. So, we use the word ground granulated blast furnace slag you take this material and pulverize it physical alteration until now we were talking about chemical alteration activation with the help of some chemicals 
Now what we are doing is we are activating a material by giving it some physical process grinding and the more I grind it, it becomes hyperactive. Most of the Ayurvedic medicines if you see how they are created or how they are formed, yes you are right. So there is something known as mortar and pestle and you sit down and just keep on grinding it. So you are basically converting the whole thing into a nano material which is going to be hyperactive, clear. So inspiration comes by seeing all these uh, established techniques, uh, why can't we apply these techniques in our subject also. So a material which appears to be so sluggish, so inactive, if I ground it, not ground it, so if I grind it and if I convert it into a powder form, this becomes your GGBFS which can be directly added to the OPC. So this becomes the PPC once I do all the whole process. So I am sure you must be getting a feel that why material characterization is so important and why scanning electron microscopy gives you good idea about the material. Now using a scanning electron microscope I can find out the mineralogy also. There are different types of probes which can be atta attached and I can check on the surface of uh, the particle what is its chemical composition this type of facilities we have. In concrete technology, uh, people who are trying to create different type of concretes, scanning electron microscopy is at most important. Suppose if I ask you to create a concrete for uh, the dome of a nuclear reactor, so creating a concrete shell is something, but then at microscopic level to understand what type of arrangement of the uh, pores and cavities which I have created is very, very important otherwise what will happen? The chances are that uh, these fumes will go out of the reactor and it will contaminate the entire uh, geoenvironment. So now I will show you uh, what you have been mugging up in your undergraduates, soil mechanics course, flocculated and dispersed structure but you never question that how do they look like except for the one which is shown in the books. And the second question in my mind was how to quantify these type of structures. So our research group has done very good work in this area where we have first of all established the fabric structure of the fine grain materials, soils and then we have tried to quantify this also by using SEM. I do not know whether you have come across this term fabric structure of fine grain soils or not. Have you heard about this ever? Fabric is something which is normally used for clothes. In clay sciences, we use the term fabric for defining two things. One is how the particles are arranged, clear, arrangement of the particles. Second is what is the texture. So texture itself is a function of particle sizes, if you remember there is a technique of classification of the soils. At the same time we want to see how the pores look like in the, in the matrix. Well, ultimately whatever we are doing, you know the matrix becomes very, very important. Water will flow through this, gases will flow through this, bacteria will flow through this, hydrocarbons will flow through this, all sorts of things are flowing through the uh, pore structure of the soil. So fabric is a big term, it talks about the particles number one and their arrangements. So what we did is uh, imagine a sample of a soil uh, which was used for triaxial testing. So you create a sample by compacting it in a cylindrical form and then take out a small specimen out of this which is a cube of 1 centimeter, alright. And this cube of 1 centimeter, I would like to look into its grain structure or fabric structure from two sides perpendicular to each other. So one is the top view, another one is the side view. It all depends upon the type of arrangement I have in the scanning electron microscope. I can visualize this surface as well as this surface. If you are interested, you can visualize all the surfaces because the material is going to be quite heterogeneous. I hope you can realize it is a very difficult task from a triaxial sample to cut out a 1 centimeter cube sample and then 
there are different techniques of preserving the samples which I do not know whether you are aware or not. Uh, if you take a clay mineral and if it is in a saturated or wet form and the moment you expose it to the air what is going to happen? It will crack number one if it is a clay mineral. So, this is where we use different types of techniques which are becoming very common these days. Uh, lyophilization is one. We put the entire thing into liquid nitrogen, we dry freeze it, we remove the water by sublimation and whatever structure of the uh, soil particles remains that can be utilized to study its uh, fabric. So, preparation of samples is a big challenge, you know pore fluid is there inside the sample, how to remove the pore fluid and uh, you should remove the pore fluid in such a manner that the microstructure does not get changed. Most of the advanced research in geomechanics and uh, materials is now going on uh, related to the microstructure analysis. A material scientist what he or she will do? He will or she will create a structure of a material and then try to see how the surface looks like, how the particle sizes look like, how the pore structure looks like and so on, thin film coating and so on. So, this is what I was talking about when we deal with the swelling and shrinking type of soils, we do uh, freeze drying technique. Take the sample and put it in the liquid nitrogen and take it out. Sublimation of water takes place and whatever residual uh, system is that can be utilized for studying the fabric of the material. Air drying technique is not a good idea because the moment you expose moisture of the uh, clays uh, to the atmosphere, the material will shrink and crack. Sometimes we use the uh, special techniques so that uh, you know the vacuum which is being applied in the microscope uh, should not suck out all the moisture of the sample and should not make it crumble. Making samples in geotechnical engineering is an extremely challenging and daunting task. I do not know how much time you guys have spent in creating a triaxial sample and a direct shear box sample. It takes normally few days to create the samples. If you are doing research you cannot just pour the material and then compact it and then go ahead with the testing. Now, what happens is because uh, you are using electron beam, uh, you have to create a system uh, which will conduct uh, electricity all right, conduction of electron should occur. Otherwise, because soil is an insulator. So, what we do is we put a coating of normally the gold on the samples by spurting, uh, this is what is known as gold plating. So, each sample in SCM analysis has to be plated with the gold, uh, we make it conducive to the migration of electrons and uh, sometimes we do carbon coating also, we call it as a sputter and uh, uh, these are the peculiar features of the film which you create. So, gold coating uh, can absorb X-ray and uh, uh, signals which are generating within the sample. Making coating of the sample itself is a big task. It should not be very thick because if it is very thick then the features of the samples cannot be studied. If uh, the coating is very thin then the chances are that your sample particularly when you are dealing with the bio samples. Suppose, if I want to study the bioactivity in the clays, if I want to see the microbial activity all right. So, the electron beam might be harmful to the microbial or biological activities. So, these are the things which you have to keep in mind. Making samples is tough, please read the papers which have been uh, published by different researchers to learn how the samples are prepared. Now, in your uh, soil mechanics books, you have studied this phase to phase interaction of the particles, is it not? And then you call this as a dispersed structure. In real life, have you seen a sample ever? You know, this is how it looks like. So, 
it is very intricate to see if you if you realize here uh, these are the sheets of the clay particles look at this yeah here you can see very clearly this is one sheet of the clay particle which is sitting on the another sheet another sheet another sheet and so on it is very clear over here look at this this is one sheet another sheet another sheet just like the loaves of the bread and uh, this is what is face to face arrangement of the clay particles. You can see the stratification also I think this picture is very clear SEM image look at these particles they are just tagged over each other like a hanging cliff even this to this is also a face to face by the way is it not one face another face one face another face you can think of another face to face over here. So, those who go into these type of analysis uh, clay mineralogist is a very interesting subject to research on. What you must be realizing here is that uh, your question what is your question? This is a, uh, the sample for triaxial dust we are talking about right. So, we did not observe something like this. You cannot observe it by your eyes what is the magnification here if you check this is uh, how many times can you check the number somewhere 4000 times magnification look at this this is 500 times this is 4000 times and this is 1300 times magnification. So, these are very microscopic structures. So, I hope you realize what we have done is this is the triaxial sample and from triaxial sample we have taken out a sample from within we call it as a specimen 1 centimeter cube all right. So, this will have all the attributes of the sample which the triaxial sample is. Now, what we are seeing, seeing is at the microstructure level this is what is known as the you know we are talking about the fabric of the clays. So, number one the type of particles their arrangement and number three what is the texture they are giving fine. So, the system which you thought is very homogeneous and uniform is not so look at a big cavity which is getting formed and this cavity is good enough for transport of flux or the mass. So, when you study environmental geotechnics related issues where the flux and mass transport is taking place. I think we have discussed this enough. So, flux could be thermal flux which cannot be studied like this chemical flux, but yes pore space is required for migration of electromagnetic waves, electricity, chemical flux, fluid, gases, bacteria, virus everything. So, until now we were discussing that this system is non porous we thought the clays are non porous it is not like that. So, when you go and see the microstructure you will realize that within the cavities sorry within the platelets or the particles of the clays you have lot of space through which the mass transport and flux transport may occur all right. Is this ok your question is answered or no ask again I might be wrong but uh is it is the arrangement uh, like face to face arrangement uh, somewhat because of the compaction which we do for the triaxial testing? I think you have already studied all these things. So, when you are mixing water to a clay material and if water percentage is less than the OMC what type of particular arrangement you have? Disordered clear. So, this is flocculated. So, as you keep on tamping it what are you doing you are trying to align all the particles together by imparting more and more energy and with more water. So, what water does water acts as a lubricant. So, the more and water more and more water you add into the soils particles have a tendency to get aligned in certain fashion and that is what the dispersed structure is. So, by virtue of compaction and by giving more water to the soil I can create a phase to phase arrangement of the particle which is known as dispersed structure 
all right fine and then you know hydraulic conductivity variation also so if you superimpose on gamma d versus w hydraulic conductivity versus w in the flocculated state the hydraulic conductivity will drop very fast as you approach the omc because system is becoming more denser you are compacting it gamma d increases and then beyond omc what happens omc is the maximum possible density so the hydraulic conductivity is minimum but when you add more water to the sample the hydraulic conductivity picks up so if you plot k versus hydraulic conductivity versus moisture content graph and superimpose with the compaction curve you will realize at omc the conductivity value is absolutely less on left hand side of omc which is the dry of omc your material is uh, you know flocculated clear but when you come into the wet state this becomes dispersed i hope this is the funda I mean, like you can interpret it the way you want so when you are designing different type of filters the first question would be at what density i should be compacting these materials how much moisture content i should be adding to this i don't know whether you remember this or not if i have a proctor compaction curve for a given gamma d i have two moisture contents what is the significance of that you have forgotten so you have to understand now which side of the moisture content i should be utilizing at the same gamma d and for what purpose because ultimately this is going to be linked with the type of structure which you are creating so when you are creating a body of the dam whether i should be compacting the material dry of optimum or wet of optimum when i am trying to use this system as a bearing strata what i should be doing the bearing of the dispersed structure is more or bearing of the flocculated structure is more so these things you have to ask questions to yourself that's why soil mechanics is becoming a interesting subject provided you study it properly so when the question is like how to utilize this state of the material for what purpose how to stop migration of flux and and activity gases filters this that when you are designing you have to go into the microscopic state of the material i hope you are getting this point i don't want you to become an expert i remember i said long back i don't want to create so what you have seen through triaxial cell uh, triaxial specimen you have not gone into the microstructure first of all imagine if i if i i would have asked you to do a triaxial test at the failure plane i would have asked you to take a sample clear and one sample from the middle of the one third one third one third and then compare it and see how shearing has altered the microstructure of the material that would have been a very interesting thing so then you would see literally that you know i started with this dispersed state or flocculated state and how the orientation of the grains is getting changed and that's what the shearing does you know where all this is being used you will be surprised to know that how this information can be used to to win many cases which are pending in the court as i said these are all evidences you remember <laughs> so i have an evidence that what you have done i have taken a photograph with whom you are meeting what type of deals you are doing so the same thing i am doing here you know i am i have evidence so i can show literally that what type of failure has occurred here and whether this was a mistake of the designer or not yes profession is becoming very very critical forensic examination there is a subject i think i discussed this in the class that in geomechanics lot of forensic engineering is being discussed nowadays why why should i go into the micro detailing of the samples i am trying to prove my point so if somebody says that look your activity is being sensed in my property line you remember long back we were discussing this that if you dispose something over here and if goes here this guy is going to sue you now somebody says that you know i was running my industry and this guy started a 
forging unit here and he established a furnace at the basement of his building. I mean, there were three building failures in Bombay city where I was involved with and I ultimately proved that all the compensation has to be given to these guys by this guy though his industry has failed. He has lost his property but he is a culprit, <coughs> he is a criminal. Why? Because when you are thermally treating these materials, their grain structure will be totally different. So, most of the R&D ideas come out of the consulting world. When you sit down, think about how to defend this case and what very high temperatures might have done to the soils. Grab a sample, cut it thin slice, do SEM analysis, interpret and make a hypothesis. I hope you are realizing the whole game of what environmental geotechnics is. So, these characterizations are not only limited to the copy books and the laboratories, they are forensic examinations and they are supposed to be the most scientific way of interpreting your results. This is part okay. Let us see now these another beautiful stack of particles. I mean these are the kaolin plates, hmm? look like papad stacked. <laughs> So, uh, the beautiful arrangement of the grains, you look at this, you know this is face to face and lot of porosity is there. So, slowly and slowly I will switch over to the porosity of the systems by using all advanced techniques. Because I just said, where are you going to use this information if somebody says that something is leaking out of your facility. It could be gas, it could be liquid, it could be chemicals, it could be any type of sludge contaminant, clear. So, there I have to show that under these circumstances either nothing can pass through or if I am devil's advocate, I will say everything has passed through. So, look at this, there are a lot of micro cavities which are getting formed over here through which a lot of mass flux can migrate, agreed. And then I will quantify this also, very soon you will learn in the next lecture how to quantify everything and put them in a number form. See, because once you become an expert, nobody can defeat you, I mean you rule over the world. Yes, and that is what education and higher technical education should do. If you write a line, it is absolutely difficult to defy that. Yeah, if you are writing in your census, so because you write a line and you have to sign and you have to issue the certificate that this has happened. So, this is what today's practice of environmental geotechnics is. I think I have given enough ideas. I am doing something and if somebody challenges there, you know, look, this has gone there minus the air phase, I am required there. So, most of the industries are fighting with each other, pollution, pollution and pollution. Um, so, this is you know phase edge, edge to edge interactions, typical flocculated systems. Look at this, this is also beautifully arranged, you know, phase to edge, edge to edge, edge to edge, phase to edge, phase to edge, this is beautiful edge to edge. Can you see this? Two particles just sitting like this. And then there are a lot of micro porosities, macro porosities and we will discuss this, how to quantify the whole game. So, you are getting a feel of how at microstructure the material looks like. You can say that the material characterization is being taught to make you an expert in forensic geotechnics. And forensic geotechnics is all about creating evidences against something or for something. 